Okay, we're back from the break. So we're going to move on and talk about uh, the movement called realism that comes right after romanticism. And here's where things get overtly political, um, starting with, with realism. Not that romanticism wasn't political in some ways, but realism is probably the most self-consciously political movement uh, that we'll end up looking at this, this semester, um, because we're ending here. So like with neoclassicism, like with romanticism, it's good to go in and just talk about some of the key points of, of, of these movements. So with realism, uh, we're safely within the political. Almost every, every painting we look at is going to have some kind of um, political commentary about society, about the economy, um, and you'll, you'll no, notice quite a bit about the working class um, and revolutionary politics. So in 1848, there's a, an important revolution that happens, not just in France, uh, but more or less there's an upheaval throughout Europe, in Germany and France and Italy and other places. So it's a, it's a major, major moment. So 1789, of course, very important revolution in France, but uh, you have another revolution in 1830, and then this other one in 1848, which is even, it's even bigger, um, very consequential. So a lot of the, let's say, working class, working class politics start to, start to uh, galvanize during this period. And so there's an emphasis on the working class. This is really the first movement in history now where you're going to be seeing everyday people, lower class people, workers um, on the job, in some cases toiling, in some cases um, doing very difficult work. Um, in some, you're, you're, you're going to see depictions of, of exploitation. And this is, this is the key um, this is one of the key ways in which to understand realism. Realism doesn't simply mean that you're going to get paintings or sculptures, but we're only looking at paintings for this class. It doesn't mean you're, you're going to get paintings that look naturalistic, that look like reality. They will. Uh, but realism, um, as a capital R term, as a movement, it's, it's, it's a depiction of the real world um, in its grimy, messy, exploitive uh, dimensions. So it's inherently political. So it's not just naturalism. It's a naturalistic depiction of the world for political uh, means, for political intent. Um, so that's really important to understand. We saw this a bit with romanticism. Truth be told, this idea starts with romanticism, but it's in realism where it really just explodes completely. There, there, there's not going to be any looking back to the past, so to the Middle Ages, to, to the Renaissance, to um, the ancient period, um, um, Greece or Rome, there's no looking back anymore. Even like someone like Jericho, we saw in the first half of class, he's still a bit neoclassical, he still has an idealizing, to a certain degree, idealizing way of painting that brings you back to the renaissance that brings you back to um, ancient greeks and those are the paradigms of of western beauty um, and form especially of the human body with realism no there's no looking to the past there aren't going to be any references to mythology to religion um to anything that's in the past it's the harshness of the present only so it's very in your face and it's very uh, contemporary it's, it's about its own contemporaneous moment in history which is why it's then important to realize that all these revolution um, and this this organization of the working class is uh, is starting to happen in the mid middle part of the 19th century. We're going to see it through the work, and in some instances, some of the artists are not only painting the working class and revolutionary politics that are on the left, but they're they're actually a part of these movements themselves. Um, if they're not communist, they're socialist. So the 19th century is the, the beginnings of this history of socialist and communist um, um, left working class politics. And so it's no coincidence that <clears throat> right at this moment in 1848, you have Marx and Engels, two of the more important political philosophers in history, writing one of the most 
influential and important tracts of political philosophy, which is the Communist Manifesto. If you've never read it, uh, if you've only heard things about it, um, I highly recommend reading it at some point. Um, it's an important document for understanding the 19th century, but of course the 20th century too, um, and our current moment. There are some incredible passages in the Communist Manifesto that seem to already augur, foreshadow our, our global um, economic system that we have now in all its glory and it's all it, and all in, in all its misery at the same time um, and exploitation. So it's a really important document, and it's also important for understanding the 20th century and how communism uh, became um, embedded in totalitarian politics um, and communism, the ideals of communism, of everybody being equal, of living in common, um, in fact, became became a nightmare um, in certain places in the world where where it was where it was tried out. So this this is a, these are really big ideas, a really important history uh, to know, and it starts right at this time. Um, it's written in 1848. And one of the key ideas in, 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 in Marx and Engels um, is to try to understand history scientifically. This is around the time of Darwin. Um, so this is the first time we, have to, we actually start understanding what we are as a species, um, of what we are biologically, where we came from, um, in a scientific way, in a way that can be empirically um, um, shown hypothesized and so on and so forth so Marx is trying to do the same thing for history itself so he's asking himself how does history happen like what is the the essence of history um, history was often thought if it was thought at all history itself has a history which is weird um, our understanding of history is largely begins in the 19th century but most people would uh, before this period would have thought history is something that unfolds in the in the mind of God um, or it's something that unfolds um, according to human reason. Um, it's something that unfolds, or something that doesn't unfold, that, that we just live in a more or less a timeless present, that there's no conception of history yet. So for Marx, he's trying to come up with a, a scientific understanding of history, which means it would be materialist, which means it could be something you could see and verify uh, and touch and palpably feel. And so he thought, so what is, what is history? Um, what makes it go? What's the engine of history? It's not some god we can't see. It's not some idea that 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 we don't have access to. Um, he says history was always run by class struggle. It was always run by those who have the means of production, those who have power, those who have capital, those who have money, right? Um, those who own things, um, and then those who don't, those who are in servitude, those who are in slaves or they're serfs or uh, their wage laborers, um, like most of us are. Like we, we sell our labor time to make, to, to make a wage, right? Um, and so he thinks that history uh, has always run on this friction between classes, and that by the time you get to the 19th century, it's very clear that there are really only two classes. There's something about his time for him where he thinks that the engine is very, very clear because there are only two fuels and they're feeding off each other, and they're constantly in friction. Um, and that, of course, would be the bourgeoisie, um, those who own capital, those who own uh, the warehouses, and 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 um, and and and, um, and employ people, and then those who don't own anything, who don't have capital, and all they can do is is work, um, and end up being exploited. And so there's this tension. Um, he calls it a, a dialectical process um, between the working class um, and the, the, the bourgeoisie. That's the end of hit, engine of history. And the whole point then of writing about this is to make the, the working class aware of this. To make the working class aware of the fact that in some, in some ways they are the engine uh, of history. Um, and so we'll talk about that more in a second once I show you a pretty famous uh, poster. But I want to show you this first. Uh, this is Daumier. Uh, he, was a French, um, he was a French artist who did all these incredible drawings, which I think you can tell. This is basically the, the, the legacy of political cartoons, right? Character. Um, and this is, this is made around in, in the earlier, early, somewhat earlier 19th century. But already you're seeing class politics play out here. Uh, in this drawing. So here's Gargantua, um, this large sort of kingly monarchical figure here. 
uh, and then you have all the poor people in the front. He's placed like a, a, a mother and her child in a way that's, I think, tugging at us. Um, everybody is giving the little, little money they have, and then these uh, more well-to-do people in coattails, they're sending the money up, putting it into the, the mouth of like this big pear-shaped uh, king, and he's actually then pooping out legislation. And then you notice like the parliamentary building in the back there. Um, so you're seeing gre the greasing the wheels of class politics here. Um, you're basically seeing like what, what, what you could, and some people will describe the way in which our government functions uh, through lobbying, right? Very wealthy, important people or corporations, they're able to lobby the government to write laws in certain ways. Whereas people without any power, uh, people with very little money, they have very little way um, to influence the way in which laws are written and um, the, the, in the way the country, the country is governed. Um, and I think in some ways, with all these bills that are, that are being talked about, bills that have been passed through um, uh, for relief during this pandemic um, and those that are, that are being proposed, I think we're kind of seeing these, uh, th this kind of uh, class politics Play, play out in a very similar similar way, right? People losing their jobs, um, people having no savings, um, and then not, m may not necessarily be, be being represented as well as they could, whereas people with means and, and, and large, large companies um, are getting relief to certain degrees. So this is this is an old idea. Um, um, and this kind of society that's that that, that, that structure that's set up to, to, to be deemed um, unequal um, would be something Daumier is commenting um, in this print. And then this is very current with what realism was all about, because it tried to show you these class these class politics, so we're doing a lot of a lot of um, political philosophy. Um, we're doing a lot of politics in this class. This is also a poster that um, would describe the way in which class politics works. Um, this would become, uh, oh, it'll end up becoming an important po poster for the, the Russian Revolution in the early 20th century. But this shows you, um, in some sense, what Marx, what we were talking about before with Marx, about how, um, how history is run through class struggle. And the reason why Marx and Engels would write something like a Kanyamis Manifesto is to um, send out the word to normal, everyday, working-class people to let them know that actually, while they think they might be powerless, while they might they think they're the ones without the power, without money, they're the ones who are getting exploited, just barely surviving, living in horrible conditions, Marx uh, and Engels say, actually, the moment that the working class realizes that without them all society doesn't function it all just breaks down that's when they realize they have the power so this this uh poster um um shows you this so on the top of course in this in this sort of um capitalist system you have money at the top profits um then you have the people that rule so either, you know, like a, a dictator or a king or an emperor or, or a president. Um, you have the clergy. Um, Marx very famously, sa fam famously said that uh, religion is the opiate for, ma for the masses. Religion is there just to keep people um, in check. That's why on the level of the clergy here of this like cake, basically, um, it says we fool you. Um, on the second part, is, are, is, is the police and the military so those that keep order keep the laws that are that are uh, enacted by the people above them and then we have the bourgeoisie uh, you know the, the all the people the flappers it looks like the 1920s uh, of course this is a little bit before um, they're having they're living it up having a great time um, eating whatever they want drinking whatever they want and basically just living a lavish, lavish lifestyle then at the bottom are is the working class so this poster, what it tries to do visually is exactly what uh, Marx and Engels were trying to convey, is that, hey, don't you realize that you're the one holding this whole thing up? That if you just let it go, it all crumbles? Once the worker becomes conscious of this, they become the proletariat. They become 
uh, the, 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 the proletariat, which is, which is conscious of the fact that, in fact, they have the power. And so actually we're seeing some of this play out too because think of um, uh, all the delivery people out there. People are delivering food. People are delivering uh, medicine, delivering packages. Uh, I think about this. A, a lot of people have written about this recently. But um, the way in which, myself included, the way in which um, we're able to sort of live through um, this lockdown, live through this present this present state of, of, of um, the economy that's dictated and, and limited by uh, by this pandemic, is through the precarious work of, of people delivering stuff. Um, they're actually very visibly keeping things going when so much else is not going, right? So for Marx, he would, he, he would say, "Hey, get together, um, organize." And make sure you, you, you tell everybody, you show everybody that, in fact, without you, society, like, all of this is not going to work. Um, and then that gives you power, that gives you leverage, right? So this is the idea of, like, unions. This is the idea of, of working class politics um, and labor rights and all this stuff that really before this period is unheard of, right? Um, little kids are working 12 hours a day in, in a factory, right? So... Um, this all starts to ch change, thankfully, slowly but surely, across the, the 19th century, where all these ideas are really brimming forth. So I hope that makes sense for everybody. This is a crash course in um, in uh, working class politics and Marxism. Um, it's very um, I've gone very quickly, but I hope I hope that made that made sense. So let's dig a little deeper, and here we're act we're going to actually get to some of the artworks where all these ideas are pretty manifest, they're, they're present. And for the, for the realism section, I like to order them, um, again, using Marx. He wrote, uh, this is some of his earlier work. That's even before the, the manifesto, economic and philosophical manuscripts, but they were very influential. Um, and in, in this writing, he has, a, he has a term that's become very, very important, uh, very well known. Uh, and very well theorized, and that's the idea of alienated labor. So Marx famously depicts workers under capitalism as suffering from four specific types of alienated labor. Alienated, um, broadly speaking, can, can mean that you feel estranged. Um, if you're alienated, you're like you feel like separated, like you're not a part of something. Um, or if you're alienated, you can also be in, in some ways like abused. Um, so think of alienated in that more capacious definition of both being separated from something but also um, being harmed by that separation. So that's really important. So alienated labor is an important concept for the early Marx. And we see a number of examples in the works uh, that have to do with realism, which would make sense because realism has everything to do with working class politics and all these ideas that are bubbling forth during this period. So the first type of alienated labor that Marx talks about is when the product, as soon as it's made by the worker, is taken away from the worker. So, um, you know, a classic example is that um, you, you make something, um, but both the, the instruments that you use to make that thing and the thing itself, you don't own. All you own is your labor, which you get paid for, but whoever owns... Um, the instruments and, and the things you make, they're the ones who can profit from it. So you make something, like someone in China working in Foxconn, they make an iPhone, but of course they can't take that iPhone home. Uh, that iPhone goes out and it's, it's, uh, Apple owns it and Apple can sell it for a lot more money than, than um, what it was made for. It's bare parts or for the labor, and that's how profit is made. So this is what Marx called the, the, the first type of alienated labor, where you're alienated from your own, um, from your own hard work, right? And we have a beautiful example of this. Uh, this is Jean-François Millet, The Gleaners, uh, uh, one, of the more, one of the most famous realist works. And with Millet, you have, it's, Millet is actually used often quite beautiful. Um, so he's showing you backbreaking work but it's in a setting. It's pretty bucolic. It's kind of, it's kind of a lovely setting. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever read their Tolstoy. Tolstoy is definitely someone to read. I know they're huge. War and Peace 
it's a door stopper uh, but it is a great beautiful beautiful book uh, wonderful book to read or uh, Anna Karenina also another door stopper he only wrote huge books but there are all these wonderful scenes of, of, of working class of working people um, serfs in the case of Tolstoy they had just finished their day and they're just kind of like basking in the bliss of, of being of being tired and there's the sun going down and so there's this really beautiful uh, quality to Mie's paintings pretty bucolic this sort of rustic lovely um, lovely vision but he is showing uh, work. He is showing backbreaking work, and here he's showing a specific form of 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 exploitation and alienated labor. So you're in a field, um, hay, right? This is probably wheat, a wheat field. So you have all these wheat, uh, all, um, all these barrels of wheat in the back. You have a guy on a horse on the way back there. He's probably like a middle manager or something like that. You know, he's probably working for the person who owns the wheat, who owns the land making sure everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing. And these three women, um, they're in the front. Notice how they're tied to the land. Like this one on the right, she almost, notice, like painters don't do anything by accident. The top of her hat almost comes over the horizon line of, of the landscape, but doesn't. So they're all visually embedded within the land. Um, the other two are, are physically reaching down to the land. And their backs are, you gotta imagine, if you're doing this all day long, your back, it's gonna, it's gonna feel terrible. So um, that's another form of being alienated. But gleaning, the, the term gleaners that this paint, the, the reason this is called, is that this is what they're doing. This was the practice of gleaning. So gleaning was when um, a worker, they put in their shift, and it probably wouldn't be eight hours, it would be like 10 hours or something like that, maybe longer. Um, and all day long, they're, they're, they're cultivating the wheat, right? But at no point can they take any of that wheat home with them. They don't own it. All they own is their labor that they can sell to whoever owns the wheat. So the wheat goes to the producer who can make profit, right? So they don't have any, they don't have any uh, wheat. So all the stuff that they've produced, all the stuff that they picked and harvested, that's their labor. Um, but they're alienated from it at the end of the day because they can't take any of it home. So to, to reinforce the sort of the, the, the dire quality of the working class during this period is that the, the, the owner would, would say, okay, fine, you, you can't take any of the wheat that you pick uh, when you're picking it for me, but at the end of the day, you can go back out into the field when you're done on your own time and go pick up some of the scraps, pick up whatever's left behind to then go home and make bread for your family, that sort of thing, right? So that's what you're seeing here. They're done working for the day, but they gotta keep going uh, and keep working just to get the scraps of whatever wheat was left behind so that they can then feed themselves, right? Um, so gleaning itself seems like, um, a, a, it seems like a pretty ridiculous, um, um, unjust practice, right? I mean, if someone owns all this wheat, all this land, and they have workers, they could just say, yes, work for me for eight hours, but then um, why don't you just take some, some of the wheat home with you so that you at least have food, right? No, on top of the work, they have to go out and glean. So the gleaning itself is a type of alienated labor just because it's extra work, and it's probably a type of, um, uh, it's probably exhausting. But I think no point, no, no painting depicts alienated labor um, as well as this one, this concept of not being able to take home the labor, the thing that you produce. One last thing about this painting, which I always find lovely, is notice the bonnets of the workers. Notice, can you tell um, what Mia has done here? One is blue, one is red, one is yellow. And that's not a coincidence, those are the primary colors. And what does primary color mean? Um, with these three colors, you can make any other color. Right? Those are the three base colors. Uh, so if you want orange, you mix red and yellow together. If you want green, you, you mix yellow and blue together. Right. So it's as if through this really sort of poetic use of color in these bonnets, he's saying that, um, yes, they're the ones being exploited. They're the ones who have to glean at the end of the day. Uh, but in fact, they make up uh, they, they make up the painting like without these three without these three primary colors you don't have this painting because all of the color the whole beautiful scene that you're seeing here this landscape is made by these three colors so it's there's a way in which Mie has done this 
like a visual analog of the, the leftist idea that once the worker knows that they're the ones propping up and structuring the economy, that they, they make it up, um, that, they have, that they have power. So there's a little maybe a poetic gesture here through the, through the color and the bonnets. So there's a second form of alienated labor. Um, and this is when the activity itself, the work itself, is experienced as torment, right? So we have, I mean, sadly, we have all sorts of examples of this today. Again, you can go back to Foxconn um, in China and the making of iPhones. There are some pretty horrible stories of how um, the management there had to set up nets because uh, people would jump and try to commit suicide. Um, and so the nets would catch them. Um, and so just imagine any type of work where you're, 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 you're constantly uh, doing something um, that, that, that becomes physically painful. Um, it, can be, it can be a torment. So a lot of factory positions, a lot of factory jobs um, in the 19th century and still today would be um, experiment, uh, experienced as, as torment. Um, just imagine um, slaughterhouses and meat production is uh, thankfully a lot in the news right now. Um, just imagine uh, what it's like for someone who has to work uh, day in, day out in a, in a slaughterhouse. Um, it's both incredibly dangerous um, and it's physically and then psychologically um, tasking. A lot of people have post-traumatic stress disorder from working in these places. So that's a really severe instance of alienated labor where the labor itself is uh, um, is experienced as torment on the on the on the part of the on the part of the worker. So no no painter shows you alienate, alienated labor in this sense as well as Courbet. Um, Courbet is probably the key realist uh, in the in the middle part of the nineteenth century. He even um, takes part in um, anarchist and socialist uh, politics. Um, even in some ways as part of, of some of these revolutions. And his paintings, um, I think you would say that they're the paintings of the working class. So this is a, one of his most famous paintings, The Stonebreakers, which actually is now missing. Um, it went missing after the Second World War. So this is probably the most famous missing painting in history. And it's The Stonebreakers. Um, and stonebreaking, this is where we get the idea, the second idea of alienated labor, was probably the hardest, lowest job in society. Um, so on a grand scale, this is five by eight feet. This is, a, you know, this is not Jericho large, but this is a large painting. Um, these large paintings, normally you would have mythological scenes or, or, or kings or uh, um, upper class or religious scenes, right? That's what these big historical paintings would usually be about. Corbin comes along and says, no, I'm going to give you the worker, the lowly worker in all his glory um, in this large um, history painting. And so here's an example of David. Uh, once the revolution goes bad, he becomes the favorite painter of Napoleon. Um, so this is just a little bit before this. This is what people would have expected of big uh, paintings at this time, right? Of historical figures um, that are usually very idealized. Notice, I always love, like Napoleon was famously short. Uh, look how big he is. I mean, that horse is like a tiny horse. If It's just not to scale between human and horse. If anybody's ever actually seen a horse in person up close, horses are big creatures. They're wonderful. Uh, this is a totally tiny horse. Um, of course, it's to make Napoleon look bigger and stronger and, and more uh, more powerful in this scene of, of, of war, right? But this is, this is what large-scale paintings would be reserved for. Um, so for an artist to come along uh, like Courbet, and, and have this large canvas filled with the two of the lowest workers in society, the stonebreakers, uh, was quite radical. And with Courbet, unlike Millet, there's something actually quite, I don't know if ugly is the right word, but it is really abrasive. Even the quality of the paint itself feels a little like burlap sandpaper, like there's something really harsh. Not only is the scene harsh, but the way it's depicted is harsh. There's no real pretty colors, uh, this landscape, it's, it's like there's this shadow. It's completely dominating these two, these two people. You only get a glimmer of the sky all the way in the back. Um, you have tools, but not only tools. You also have like a pot with bread and like a utensil. So you get the sense, oh, well, they're working. They're, 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 
they're breaking rocks all day long by the side of the road. Uh, and their lunch break probably consists of something they had to bring and they might not have that much time, right? Um, and then you also then notice their clothing. Uh, the young boy, he's like, it's all ripped, it's all tattered. Um, uh, same thing with the old, the old, the old man. Um, and they're wearing, um, you know, these shoes. Like, there's a very disheveled, abrasive, really lowly quality to this, even though it's this large uh, painting. So he, in some ways, he's trying to dignify the working class through paint. Um, and there's one other thing that, that he's doing here. Notice the faces. They're kind of anonymous. You definitely can't see the boy, um, and you can only see a little bit of, of the man. So it's as if they're, they're less specific people, and they're more like universal types. And then you get this sort of really dire sort of fatalism where the young boy, it looks like this is a cycle, like he, inevitably he's seeing his future in the old man, right? Um, this is not a moment where you really have um, class mobility, right? If you're born a stonebreaker, odds are you're going you're gonna to die a stonebreaker. Um, if you're born an aristocrat, you're going to, you know, you're going to be, you're a baron, your, your, your kid is going to be a baron too, right? So... Um, Inherently, he's showing you this kind of cycle of, of, of class politics um, that, that, that we're in society. And to a certain degree, uh, in some ways, a big degree, it's still, it's still with us today. So the second, the second uh, definition of alienated labor, work experience, this torment, um, the, stone break, the stone breakers are a perfect encapsulation of that idea. Then the third... Um, you would be alienated from your species being. That's another form of alienated labor, um, which means that the work doesn't tap into the fully lived potential of human beings. So this one's a little more difficult to understand because this term species being might sound a little strange to you. But what, what Marx is saying here is that inherently um, humans as a species, we have an incredible capacity to do things, to think, to imagine, to create, um, we're 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 incredible creatures. Um, there's no question about it, right? Um, but he says that most human beings, because of they, where they are historically and where they are, what they have to do simply to get by, and the work, the labor they have to take, um, it it doesn't even come close to allowing them to cultivate. Um, this incredible co co uh, complexity that is this the human brain um, and the and the human being, right? So that's what he means by species being. We as humans have an incredible capacity for all sorts of things, but we might not necessarily live in a situation in a social political situation where we're allowed to actually cultivate that, um, or in some cases even know about it. I mean, I've definitely had students who 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 because of where they come from, they they don't know how smart they are. Um, it's 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 a, um, it's kind of a tough thing to see. Um, eventually, hopefully, they, they do right, but it's it, it's a it's a work of a work of labor. And there are some people in the world that uh, they never um, understand the potential that they have. So this is something that Marx really laments, and he says this is because of this economic system, this capitalist system, um, that in many many instances it just needs it just needs you know bodies to do things. Uh, but not complex, creative minds um, that, they, that they inherently are. Um, so here's an example uh, from, a, um, from a contemporary artist. Because this, again, I think, these, I think you can tell that these ideas that we're describing here, they all still feel very current. There's still something quite current about, um, about these class politics that, that, that start up in the 19th century. This is a photographer named Edward Bertinsky who does these hu huge, incredible photographs um, and he did one series in China where he went through and took, took these large format, uh, really quite beautiful uh, photographs of, of factories. Uh, but of course, the, 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 the work that you're seeing inside the, inside the image is, is a grueling work. It's, it's a form of torment. Uh, but it's also, um, it also depicts how work can um, be completely unfulfilling. Um, and uh, whatever capacity we might have as human beings isn't being met because the work is, is drudgery. Um, so this is a chicken processing plant 
Um, so m millions of birds are being are being cut cut up, uh, and workers are doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. Um, whereas they could be studying mathematics, they could be studying art history, they could be studying philosophy, they could be writing music, they could be doing all these other all these things that that uh, we as human beings can do. Whether you live in China, or whether you live in uh, New York City, or whether you live in uh, where, wherever you are. Um, the work itself does not allow you to tap into that potential. And so that's what Marx means by alienated labor at the level of species being. So I hope that makes sense. And then the, the fourth one. Um, and this one uh, is also quite interesting. And I think you can tell they all in some ways overlap or they, they connect to each other. Um, they're, they're, they're forms of labor where, where you're alienated all four, like you run the table, you play alienated labor bingo, basically. Um, but the fourth one is when you're alienated from other human beings. When the work you do is reduced, uh, where the social relations you have through your work are reduced to economic exchange. And this might actually be timely for us because I think if you're like me uh, and so many people... Um, living in, in you know social isolation for now a few months you're sort of dying we're social creatures you're kind of dying to like you know like talk to talk to somebody uh, somebody you don't normally talk to or like you know um uh go out to dinner with friends and you know like you know, there, there are these social relations that are really important for us but marx saw that there are ways in which the social relations we have when, while we're working um or the class position that that we hold there's something inauthentic or fake um, when they're reduced to a simple economic exchange. So the artist that did a, a, an incredible job and a very scandalous job of showing this fourth form of labor um, is Manet. And he's actually the last, he's now the last artist we're, we're going to study. This is Olympia from 1863, and he showed it in the big uh, salon, which would be the big public exhibition of the time that the whole public could see. And this is probably the most scandalous painting uh, one of the most scandalous paintings in Western history. Uh, there's a long, complex literature about this painting. You wouldn't imagine how many people have written about it. Um, but here you have Olympia lying on her bed. You have a black cat that seems to be hissing, uh, arching his back uh, or her back, and st standoffish. And you have this maid servant, a black maid servant, um, offering Olympia flowers. And so there are all sorts of reasons why this was scandalous um but the, probably the, the 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 and some of it has to do with race um the fact that the maid is black some has to do with with animality the fact that you have this hissing cat on the bed um things that people had a hard time uh back then and still today sort of reconciling they were afraid of these things um or had prejudices or biases but probably the most scandalous part was the fact that Olympia was defiantly looking out at you as the viewer, uh, and her name was a common name for a prostitute. So Manet is showing you a nude, a female nude, but not as a goddess. So we could compare it with Titian. This is a, a, a Renaissance work, the Venus of Urbino, very, very famous. So here you have the v Venus. You know, she's a, she's a mythic figure. She's Venus. Uh, but she's nude and she's on the bed and here you have like the nice dog who's faithful and sleeping and you have the, the servants in the back who are about to dress the Venus uh, but she, he, here she's naked and she's turning the cheek to one side she's kind of demure she seems more passive um, but of course it's a highly sexualized image but a very safe one um, for the viewer like she's very passive and she's ideal like she's there's a distinction between nude and naked. She's nude. There's like this beautiful, ideal nude goddess sort of quality to her. Um, and this is the kind of painting that they would have loved at the, at the time, even in the 19th century. So just these mythologi mythologizing um, um, scenes of nudity and satyrs and uh, like little cupids riding dolphins and all this stuff, like just this very safe, sanitary, idealized um, kind of sexuality. Uh, and beauty that's uh, not at all part of present day society. So this is why Manet was so scandalous because he gives you a nude, but she's actually not nude, she's naked. 
uh, there's something much more frank about the fact that she doesn't have clothes. And she's a woman. She's not a goddess. And not only a woman, but she's a prostitute, right? So people were completely scandalized by this. Um, they called her a gorilla. Uh, they called her a cadaver. They said, they said like, like, the public was really, really threatened by her. Um, and one of the reasons they, they were so threatened is that Manet dared to hit on a topic, on a subject in society that people were very uneasy about, and that was prostitution. Um, not only the fears of venereal disease, this is before penicillin, this is like, you know, you could die if you get syphilis, you can die if you get certain venereal diseases, um, if you go to a brothel, so there's a certain amount of anxiety about that, but also um, in the latter part of the 19th century, more and more, um, society, uh, cities are structured more and more as, as um, economic landscapes where everything is becoming reduced to uh, making money, making profit, um, and exchanging goods. Um, and in this instance, in this case, Manet is almost showing you the, the logical conclusion of this type of thinking is that if everything is up for sale, if anything can be a, everything can be a commodity, if society, a capitalist society, reduces everything to profit margin and exchangeability, then it only makes sense that even the human body can be exchanged, can become uh, a consumable good or a commodity. And this maybe still makes people uneasy today. It definitely made people uneasy back then. And this shows then the fourth form of being alienated. This is, this is, this is like the perfect example of 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 um, of alienated labor of experiencing social relations as inauthentic and reduced to just economic exchange. Because think about it, like the most intimate um, moment that that um, people usually think about is to have sex with someone you know someone they um, they're attracted to and and um, they're fond of or they might be in love with and, this, and so on and so forth. Um, that's like this authentic, it's supposed to be this authentic thing, right? This authentic experience of human beings. Here you're seeing someone selling their body, selling their the, um, their sex for money. So the thing that's that, that um, should be the most like intimate and authentic, in fact, is simply uh, an economic exchange like sexuality itself is reduced to a social um, economic exchange which for Marx is part of this fourth type of alienated labor where even your rapport even with your sexual relationships that you have with other people those are reduced to um, um, to financial gain to profit margin and to economic exchange and so we don't really have to go as far as um, as this example to think of this though, right? I mean like if you ever um, just imagine dating somebody and the only reason they're dating you is because um, they can get something. Uh, um, like they get some kind of credibility or they make some kind of money or, or they can monetize the relationship some ways. Um, I think celebrities do this a lot, no? Um, people get together because it's good for their brand. That, for Marx, he would say that that's a, that's a form of alienated um, um, that's a form of alienated labor, um, where even like a relationship is reduced to uh, profit margin. And I think there's n there's there's another painting by Manet, the last painting we're looking at all semester, where he shows this um, once more. This is his last painting, uh, the late really great painting about La Folie Berger, which is this cafe, and you have this woman who's working the bar. Uh, with champagne, uh, bass ale, uh, oranges, a flower, and so on and so forth. She's working the bar, and behind her is a large mirror. So the mirror is, is allowing you to see this cafe. Um, and cafe in French, in France, cafes are like bars, nightclubs, right? There's a trapeze artist, um, you can just see her feet. Like um, There's a chandelier, so there's all this entertainment. And you just have this sea of people in the back there, one with binoculars, um, looking at other people. It's this social gathering, people drinking and having a good time. But then you notice something strange. In the mirror, you see her again, but the the reflection doesn't make any sense. The reflection, you see the you see the mirror. This is the frame of the mirror. The reflection should basically be right behind her. You might not, if, if it was correct, since we're more or less head on, you might not even see a reflection. 
But Manet did something weird. Everything else is right. Everything matches up except for her. Everything is like, it's like she split in some weird way, right? So you get to see her back. And in front of her is a gentleman, this dandy in a top hat, right, with his cane. And he's probably ordering a drink, um, and he's probably doing more than that. So it was known at the time um, that um, you'd have men propositioning uh, women who were working. Uh, um, and this is definitely before the Me Too movement, so who knows what kind of things he's saying to her, right? Um, and when you see her not in the reflection, but quote-unquote in real life in the painting, I've never seen a face that expresses uh, tiredness and sort of disgust and just this sense of, oh, not again, right? Um, you get the sense that she's really not enjoying this this um, this exchange she's having with this guy who's ordering a drink and maybe being um, um, maybe being um, too forward or, or macho or um, 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 being a, being a jerk. Um, her reflection, on the other hand, notice how she's different. Here she's stand. She's kind of uh, standing up, somewhat more rigidly, um, at the bar. But here she's leaning forward, as if she's actually like enjoying um, the engagement she's having with this guy. Right. So this is perplexed people. Uh, and scholars, and I love, like students, when we actually have class, when we're all together, students really love talking about this painting and coming up with theories as to why you have this weird aberration in the mirror. And one way it's been interpreted is along the lines of this fourth type of alienation in, in Marx, is that uh, when she's working, she has to put up airs. She has to act out someone that she's not. She has to be inauthentic. She has to pretend, pretend that she enjoys serving this guy. Um, uh, she has to pretend that she actually finds his off-color jokes funny. Um, but the real her, the one inside, is, is, is not amused um, and is probably not feeling so great. Right. So this is a. It could be a, like a compelling interpretation of this painting is that it would it would show how social relations. Uh, when a person talks to another person is having like a you know an exchange when it's within the context of um, of of, uh, of 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 labor when it, when 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 you're working and you have to um, basically um, service be, be part of the service economy then you can become split like you almost become alienated from yourself um, and I felt this. I felt this before. I mean, as a professor, I try to be more or less myself while I'm teaching, uh, but I can't be completely myself. Um, and then there are some jobs that maybe you have where you have to act in a certain way that's not you at all, right? So while you're at work, you you almost t take on a role, um, and then you become sort of alienated from your own self. Um, it's it's kind of it is you, but it's not quite you, right? So uh, Mane Mane is depicting this really well. In this um, in this late painting. Okay, so I think I went a little a little quickly with alienated labor, um, but there are the four. So if you want to go back, you just pause it here um, and make sure you understand these four. It's an important concept. Um, has a lot of legs. Okay, everyone. So that that's it. That's that's the end of our semester. This is the last time you'll hear my voice, at least over one of these recordings. Um, I'm looking forward to reading your responses, the worksheets for this class. Um, very soon I'm going to upload the pool of images for the final, and the final will be exactly like the midterm. It's going to be a take-home, it's going to be an at-home thing. We all have a certain amount of time to work on it. Um, so there won't be any surprises there. Of course, if you have any questions, just email me. Um, and other than that, um, you it was the, 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 the few classes we had together, in person, uh, you seem like a really wonderful group. Um, it really sucks that we weren't able to sort of uh, see each other in person the whole way through because it was so promising, our discussions together, and I would have had, um, honestly, a lot more fun um, teaching you live, um, and we would have gone to a lot more places than we could um, through this mediated form of me um, giving the lecture um, as, as a recording. But I still hope you got some good things out of it. Uh, and uh, more importantly, I hope everybody stays 
stays stays well and uh, stays safe and healthy and that we uh, we get through we, we get through this whole thing okay take care everybody